So the justification that is discussed in chapters 4 and 5 and the sanctification that, um, that Paul writes about in chapter 6 and 7 find their ultimate fulfillment in chapter 8. Uh, in this passage, uh, the law uh, that is referred to here is not only God's requirement for us, uh, but the law is also his will for us. I believe it is the will of God. It was his, uh, his suffering, his design that makes me free from the law of sin and death. And I'm thankful today that is not only a requirement, but it is the will of God for us to live apart from the law of sin and death. We can live above that. Um, this lesson will show that the gospel of salvation by grace means that grace gives before it requires. Grace gives before it requires, whereas salvation by the law, the Old Testament law, uh, means that salvation is given only after we have done all that is required. And I've never quite thought of it uh, in, in those terms before. Maybe, maybe you're a scholar and a, a deep thinker and you've thought of that before, but I've never thought about how, how grace, uh, and God's grace, he gives uh, to us before... Uh, before it requires of us. The grace of God is available to us without requiring anything on our behalf. Whereas the Old Testament law that had the, the Ten Commandments and all the law that uh, was given to Moses by God and that he then gave to the people. And in order to get salvation, it required things of you. You had to keep the Sabbath. You had to do certain sacrifices. There were things that you had to do in order to roll your sins ahead uh, through the sacrifice and the requirements. But I'm thankful today that the grace that God gives us, amen, is available to us, amen, freely. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, also, this will show not only does knowledge of evil bring no deliverance, neither does knowledge of good bring salvation. Have you ever thought of that today? Um, that while evil, just knowing about evil doesn't bring deliverance, and just knowing about good does not bring salvation. I mean, it requires, there are some things that are required on our behalf. Um, chapter 7 of Romans recorded 30 uses of the word I. Chapter 8 has 20 references to the Holy Spirit. Chapter 7 shows that righteousness will last until the end, but chapter 8 shows the continual working of of righteousness unto the end. So a lot of what we are studying today hinges on a scripture that's found in Romans, the sixth chapter, in verse 14. It says, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So in chapter 8, Paul, in chapter 7 and 8, Paul is still developing, um, developing this thought. That sin does not have dominion over you. Who is he referring to? He's talking about the church. Those that have been filled with the Spirit of God. For those that are filled with the Spirit, that they're believers, they are not under the law any longer. I thank the Lord today that we are no longer under the law. But we are under grace. The chapter uh, should first of all be viewed as a whole in a theme consisting of four parts. Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 1 through 11, talk about deliverance from the power of the flesh by the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's read some of that together this morning. Uh, if someone have their Bible, we're going to turn to Romans 8. Brother Nate, looks like he's turned there. Brother Nate, when you get to Romans 8, read verses uh, 1 through 4.
those <coughs> those uh, verses uh, were one through eleven discuss deliverance from the power of the flesh by the power. Possible for us to overcome our flesh through our own willpower. Overcoming the flesh, uh, the habits of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, um, pleasing our flesh, all, all the things that we do and oftentimes justify ourselves in doing. Um, we're trying to please God, we're trying to uh, we're trying to live a good life. All those things are impossible to do through our own. We have to lean on the power of the Holy Ghost to help us live an overcoming life that is pleasing to God. Uh, verses 12 through 17 um, talk about the full realization of our sonship by the power of the Spirit. Who would like to read? Some family will adopt that child, bring them in their home, call them uh, their own, and raise them maybe uh, along with children that are uh, born of the mother and the father. And they'll, they'll treat that child just the same, and, and, and including including the, the kid in, into their uh, in their will. Let them inherit things. Uh, they'll have siblings that call them brother and sister. There's nothing they could have done to, to make that happen. And you and I, there's nothing that we did to uh, earn becoming a, a son and a daughter of Christ. There's nothing with no amount of money that we can pay to purchase our way into sonship. Uh, there's nothing, we can't live a life that is good enough to earn it. We certainly don't deserve it. But Jesus Christ paid the price for you and I on Calvary and made a way for us to be uh, the heirs of So verses 17 through 30 talk about the sufferings do not affect our position because of the power of the Spirit. Sufferings do not affect our position. And so I'm going to read, uh, Brother Ryan, read verses 17 uh, through 22.
Verses 31 through 39, talk, the theme is, in spite of everything, victory will be ours through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 31 reads this way. What shall we then we say, let me start that again. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not uh, with him also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather than is risen again, whom is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. A wonderful passage of scripture there. In spite of everything that happens to us, it, uh, whether it's a hurricane that's coming, hardships that come from a hurricane that we're all dreading coming up here, that can't separate us from the love of Christ. Whether it be uh, famine or destitution or losing a job and financial difficulty, whether it be sickness, I mean, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God if you hold on to the grace that God gives us. This chapter, as we begin to read in verse 1, says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So it begins with no condemnation, and it ends in the very end of the chapter with no separation. There's no condemnation, and there's no nothing that can separate us from Jesus Christ. Verse 1 says, there is therefore now. What does therefore mean? Therefore in the scripture is looking back at all that has occurred previously and lets us know that there is a conclusion coming. It becomes a past tense use of the word. So there is therefore now. So now is what? It is present tense. The next word is no. Uh, this in the Greek is very emphatic. There's absolutely none, ever, uh, not ever, or I could say never. Uh, there is nothing. Uh, the word no is the foundation of everything because it shows the perfection of justification to the true 
believer. Grace is intended to keep us holy and prevent us from going back into sin. There is therefore now no condemnation. Amen. No condemnation. Um, I'm so thankful today to know uh, K-N-O-W that the word no is so emphatic in this scripture. There's, there's not, you mean there's not even a little condemnation? There's not. I certainly don't deserve that. I, I, I certainly have done things that are worthy of condemnation. And we'll talk in just a second about what condemnation means. Um, or maybe we'll talk about it now. It, it, in the Greek it means adverse circumstance or judgment against. Condemnation is like you, you see a convict that has been through our legal system. First, they are arraigned, and, and then they, they are charged, and they have a, an attorney assigned to them, and they go on their day of court, and they, uh, they have a trial either by judge or jury, and then they are sentenced. I mean, if they're found either guilty or, or, or innocent, and then they are sentenced. So condemnation is like You've been found guilty, and you deserve punishment. You, you're deserving of condemnation. And there's not one person in under the sound of my voice this morning that hasn't done things that are worthy of condemnation. We do not deserve the grace and the mercy of God. Right. We don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. Uh, even the most holy, pious, godly, person that you know does not deserve God's grace. Nevertheless, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation. There is no judgment. It takes away the penalties of sin. In order for grace to be grace, there must also be an alleviation of justice. Amen. We, uh, we deserve condemnation. God's justice deserves to be carried out. But because of his grace, instead of justice and judgment, we get mercy. I'm so thankful today to know that there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. In order to have this alleviation from justice, in order to, to freely access this mercy, we have to be what? In Christ Jesus. We have to be in Christ. Amen. This qualifies what uh, constitutes a release from condemnation. Only those who are in Christ, or that is to say, who have entered into a union with Christ and no longer just know who he is. Amen. It's not enough to just know about Jesus. It's not enough to just know what is good and what is evil. We have to be in Christ Jesus. We have to be a part of the family. Only those that are in Christ will get this release from condemnation. Being in Him puts His presence and power in us. If that presence and power is in us, then condemnation cannot be. Amen. Listen to this from John, the third chapter, in verse 17. For He sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. The whole purpose of Jesus coming was not to condemn the world for the wrong and the injustices that were going on. The entire purpose of Jesus Christ coming uh, was not to set things right. It wasn't to uh, kick Rome out of Jerusalem and set up an earthly kingdom as the disciples expected. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, to, to kick out the rulers that were um, being overbearing, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and uh, they were ruling uh, the Jewish people and with an iron fist and no doubt abusing their powers. That wasn't the purpose of why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come to pull everybody that he met out of poverty. The purpose that he came really wasn't even to, to heal everybody that he encountered. The purpose that Jesus came for was to die on a cross. He didn't come to condemn the world, but he came that the world through him might be saved. We 
must understand if we only know him and are not in him. The rest of the chapter of, of Romans 8 is really null and void. We cannot just know about Jesus. We can't just have a knowledge of him, but we have to be in him. Being in him requires us to go through obedient steps. Amen. We have to be obedient. So there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. This passage or this phrase in verse 1, who walk not after the flesh, denotes a drawing by the Spirit and a following by the believers. Amen. Walk not after the flesh shows a willful intent and purpose. It shows a willful intent and purpose. That is to say, we are not to walk in that way. Our flesh wants to lead us one way, and the Spirit wants to leave us, lead us another way. Um, there are basically two paths we can follow. We can follow our own flesh, our own desires, our own will, what we think is best for us, or we can follow after the leading of the Spirit, those who do not walk after the flesh. So those who walk not after the flesh. Amen. If we walk after the flesh, what does that bring? It brings upon us sin, uh, which brings condemnation, which ultimately brings death. We know that the wages of sin is death. So to walk after the flesh brings condemnation, which brings death. To follow the carnal man. You cannot be sold out to Christ and follow the flesh. Nor can you be sold out to the flesh and follow Christ. Um, we read earlier, and we were reading Romans 8, is that the carnal mind is the enemy of God. Our carnal nature is the enemy of what God would try to accomplish in our life. The flesh and the spirit war within us. Amen. And we have to make up our minds what we're going to do, to follow after our flesh or follow after the Spirit. Uh, to walk after the flesh shows that not our that our only escape from condemnation is to not walk after the flesh. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. We can't walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So we have to walk after this shows uh, that there is a leading or a drawing of the Spirit. We are pulled on in that direction. But there is a following by a believer. If the Spirit is leading and drawing, it is incumbent upon the believer to follow. It is not enough to just be a believer of Christ. I believe that we have to be a follower of the Spirit. James puts it another way. It is not enough to be a hearer only can't just be hearers. We have to be doers. It's not enough to just hear. We have to follow. We have to obey. The spirit and the flesh both draw, but the believer follows one or the other. We follow the flesh or we follow the spirit. And we cannot follow both at the same time. The flesh and the spirit are like oil and water. They don't mix. You can put you can go home today and get you a mason jar out, and you can put water halfway, fill it up with water, and then put some oil in there, and you can shake it and shake it and shake it and set it down, and you're going to come back later, and it's the oil and the water will be separate because they do not. They're not going to mix. They're just not going to be. The one uh, and, and the other just don't get along together. Amen. Uh, it's the same thing with the flesh and the spirit. We can't we can't serve two masters. We can't do what we want to do, follow our flesh, and then say, "Oh yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus too." I mean, we can follow the flesh. We can follow the spirit. There is a choice, and it's our choice. Second uh, Corinthians five and seven: For we walk by faith and not by sight. It takes faith to walk after the spirit. Whereas following the flesh takes no more than sight. This is true of Abraham. This is true of Joshua. This is true of the prophets. I mean, they walked 
by faith and not by sight. We know that Abraham was looking for a city. Amen. A city that he never saw, but he was following after the leading of God. God said, leave this land, that was land of your fathers, and go to a place where I'll show you. Abraham goes. It's not a place that he had seen, not somewhere that he had been before, but nevertheless he followed and walked in faith. Amen. The true test of our faith is not if God answers, but rather how consistent is our walk until he does. Amen. There's a, a saying I heard someone say, and it stuck with me, and I'll share it with you. Um, it says, true faith does not demand a certain True faith doesn't demand a certain outcome. And the testing and the trying of your faith, amen, a lot of times uh, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. How are you going to behave and act when the answer to your prayer doesn't come? When the answer doesn't come, when you don't get the answer from God that you want or think you, you need, When the answer from God is no, when the healing doesn't come, when your loved one isn't healed, how's it going to affect your walk with God? Just because we're a child of God doesn't mean that we always get our way. I promise you there are thousands of prayers that are being prayed today that have been prayed because they wish this hurricane would go away. This hurricane's coming, y'all. It's coming. It's a storm. And if you would use the analogy today, Every one of us are going to face hurricanes in our life. We're going to face trials and storms uh, that are not necessarily of uh, of this world, this natural world, but uh, there may be uh, some other storm in your life. You know, problems, family problems or job problems or financial problems, uh, things that affect your health. And it's going to try your faith, but you've got to remember You get to turn it over to God. And you walk with Him faithfully. God will take care of His own. And the healing sometimes doesn't come on this world. Amen. It comes in the next world. Amen. Because we understand one thing as believers. Amen. This world is not our home. This world is is not what God has ultimately has in store for us. There's something better that is being prepared for believers. And if we're going to see that, we have to walk after the spirit we can't walk in our flesh and what our physical eyes see and what our physical senses uh, our taste and our smell and our touch and the, the things that we see we have to get beyond the senses of the flesh and we have to move on to following in God in faith and that belie- that means that it's not what we can see now faith is the substance of things hoped for Evidence of things not seen. Amen. It doesn't take faith to trust what you see with your physical eyes. But it takes faith to trust what God is asking you to see through the Spirit. Amen. We'll complete this lesson next week. So hang on to your notes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we we thank you today for this, this lesson that you've given us. I pray that, Lord, we would all be encouraged, God. Lord, by the grace that is available to those that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. God, I pray today, Lord Jesus, that each and every one of us, Lord, Lord, will forsake all the things of the flesh that lead us, Lord, down the dark paths that lead us away from you. God, that we would cling to the Spirit, that we would walk after you in faith, God. Lord, give us the courage and the strength, God, Lord, to follow you no matter where you